Hey, it's Professor Dave. I want to tell you about probability. He knows a lot about all kinds of stuff. Professor Dave explains. Probability is a mathematical concept that bleeds into our everyday lives. We make decisions all the time based on our perceived probability of success and happiness. While the probabilities that you will excel at your job or be happy in your relationship are very impractical to calculate, it's another matter entirely whether these kinds of questions are fundamentally impossible to answer. Let's go over exactly what probabilities are and how to calculate them so that we can better understand how we make predictions. Let's take something very simple, like the flip of a coin. When you flip a coin and call it in the air, predicting heads instead of tails, you are making a prediction about what will happen. We can assess the probability of that event happening by taking a number that represents your desired outcome and dividing it by a number that represents all the possible outcomes. In this case, there are two possible outcomes, heads and tails. Only one of these represents your desired outcome. That means the theoretical probability of success, if the coin is fair, is one out of two, which we represent as a fraction. This fraction could also be expressed as a decimal, like 0.5, which could also be expressed as a percentage, like 50%. All three of these are saying the same thing, that there is a one in two chance, or a 50% probability, that you will win this coin toss. What if we were to flip the coin twice and you predicted that it will be heads both times? Now there are four possible outcomes. We could get heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, or tails, tails. The two coin flips are two separate events that do not affect one another. The probability of getting heads or tails with a coin flip is always 50-50, no matter how many times you do it. So for the first flip, it's one and two, and for the second flip, it's one and two again. One half times one half is one fourth, so that's 0.25 or 25% probability of success. This is the same as saying that heads heads is one out of the four possible results for the series of events, which would allow us to arrive at one fourth straight away. If something absolutely won't happen, the probability is zero. If something absolutely will happen, the probability is one. Anything else must be some value between zero and one. So this is the interval that is allowed for probabilities. Sometimes the desired outcome isn't limited to a singular event. Let's say you have a bunch of socks in a drawer. Five are red, three are blue, seven are green, and 10 are yellow. If you reach in and pull one out at random, what is the probability that it will be red? In this case, the number of outcomes that will produce the event of getting a red sock is five, because there are five of them. Then we divide that by the total number of socks, which is 25. That gives us 0.2, or 20%. What about the probability of pulling out two socks and getting a red pair? Well, as we said, it's 5 out of 25 for the first one. But what about the second one? Now there are four red socks and only 24 socks left to choose from. So that's a 4 out of 24 probability for the second event. We multiply these together and we get 0.033, or a 3.3% probability. Not the best odds by any means. Some of the best examples of odds and probability can be found in casino games involving dice and cards. To see some examples of these, let's visit our friend Heather from Vegas Aces. Thanks, Dave. Let's start by rolling some dice. Here's a pair of standard dice, which have values on each of the six sides, from one to six. If we roll these dice, what is the probability of gain a 12? Well, this one's easy because there are only one possible outcome that will satisfy this desired event, and that's double sixes. 
it's a one in six chance that one of these will be a six and that the same thing will happen with the other. So one over six times one over six means a one in 36 chance of rolling a 12. But what about the probability of gain a sum of eight or more? This is more complicated because there are multiple combinations that will produce this outcome. We could generate a grid of all the possible dice combinations with values increasing to the right and down. And then we can highlight all of the combinations that satisfy this desired outcome. That would be these five that equal eight, these four that equal nine, the three that equal 10, and the two for 11. And that leaves the one for 12 that we mentioned before. Five plus four plus three plus two plus one equals 15 out of the 36 total possibilities or about a 41.7% chance. What are some other ways to think about combinations? How about a combination lock? If there are three digits on the lock, each with 10 possible values, then we have 10 possibilities for the first number, 10 for the second number, and 10 for the third number, and 10 cubed is 1,000. So there are 1,000 possible combinations for this lock. And in general, it's the number of possibilities per item raised to the power of the number of items. This gives us the number of permutations, or specific sequences possible when values can be repeated, like the way we could use the same number for each digit of this combination. But what if values can't be repeated? Say we have 10 people running a race, and we want to find out the number of possible outcomes for the top three finishers. There are 10 possibilities for the winner, but whoever wins can't also get second, so there are only nine possibilities for second place, and eight for third. We might notice that this is starting to look kind of like those factorials we just learned about in the previous tutorial. What if we make this 10 factorial instead. The only problem is that 10 factorial would go all the way to 1, but we want to stop after 8, so we have to put this over 7 factorial. That way, from 7 to 1, all the numbers cancel. So when we want to find the number of possible permutations when values can't be repeated, we find n factorial over the quantity n minus r factorial, where n is the total number of possible items and r is the number of items in the permutation. In this case, we want the possibilities for the top three runners out of 10. So r is three and n is 10. If we look at card games, things get even trickier since there are 52 cards in a deck. Let's say we want to analyze the probability of getting dealt a particular five card hand in poker. The first thing we need to do is figure out how many five card hands are possible. For the first card you get, there are 52 possibilities. For the second card, there are 51 possibilities since it could be any card besides the one you just got. For the third, 50, then 49, then 48. Just like with the runners, we can represent this as 52 factorial over 47 factorial. Again, this is so that from 47 until 1, all the numbers cancel, leaving us with just these five. So we can see that we are again using n factorial over the quantity n minus r factorial. But there's one difference in this case. This expression gives us the number of possible permutations for the five cards. Permutations involve a specific order for these items, just like the specific order of the top three runners. But when we play cards, the order of the cards doesn't matter. We are just looking at specific combinations, so the probability of getting a particular hand increases by five factorial, because there are five factorial ways for the exact same hand to be distributed. Since these five factorial permutations all qualify as the same combination, it means we have to place five factorial in this denominator, 
thus reducing the number of possible hands by accounting for all of the permutations that result in the same combination. Thus, we have a new expression to find the number of combinations possible when values can't be repeated. It's n factorial over r factorial times the quantity n minus r factorial. If we evaluate this expression for the number of possible five card combinations, we get this number, a little over two and a half million. Now to look at specific poker hands, let's check back with Heather. A standard deck has four suits, spades, clubs, hearts, and diamonds. Each suit consists of 10 numerical cards from ace through 10 and three face cards jack, queen, and king. From this information, we can calculate the probability of gain a specific poker hand. Let's start out with the best hand that you could get, a royal flush. That's a 10, jack, queen, king, and ace, all of the same suit. There's only one of these per suit, and there are four suits. So there are only four possible hands that result in a royal flush. 4 divided by this huge number is an incredibly tiny number, which even as a percentage is minuscule. Basically, if you get one of these in your lifetime, you're extremely lucky. Now, what about just a straight flush? This is like a royal flush in that the cards have to be in order and of the same suit, but they don't have to specifically be a 10 through ace. We could have an ace through a 5, a 2 through 6, all the way up to a 9 through a king, but not a 10 through ace, as that's a royal flush. That means that there are now 9 possible straight flushes per suit, times 4 suits, which means 36 possible straight flushes. Again, divided by the total number of possible hands, this is still a super tiny probability. But what about a 4 of a kind? Well, there are 13 possible four card combinations that would give us a four of a kind. We could have four twos, four threes, all the way up to four aces. But this fifth card can be anything except the other four cards, which means that there are 48 possibilities for the fifth card. So it's 13 times 48, or 624 possible four of a kinds. Again, we divide that by the total number of possible hands, and it's still quite small, but things are getting a little more likely. Now, how about a three of a kind? Again, there are 13 possible types of cards from an ace to king, so there are 13 types of three of a kinds. But each type can be one of four combination of suits, because if we have three kings, we can have all of the kings, but the king of spades, all but the clubs, all but the hearts, or all but the diamonds. So 13 times 4 is 52 possible 3 card combinations to get a 3 of a kind. The 4th card could be anything except these 3 cards or the 4th card of that type since that would make it a 4 of a kind, which is a different hand. So there are 48 possibilities for the 4th card. The fifth card could be anything but these three cards. The fourth of that type, this fourth card, or one of the other three cards of this type, as that would give us a full house. So there are only 44 possibilities for the fifth card. That gives us 48 times 44. But then we have to divide it by two, as these two cards could come in either order. Multiply that by the 52 possibilities for the other three cards, and we get 54,912 possible three of a kinds. Dividing by the total possible hands, we get a little over 2%, which is starting to approach the realm of likelihood. See if you could calculate the probability of gaining a full house, a flush, or a pair by using this kind of logic. So we should now understand permutations and combinations, and the ways they allow us to compute the probability of certain things happening. The extent to which this can be applied to complex events involving the stock market and human behavior is up for debate, but at least for the purposes outlined here, let's check comprehension.
Thanks for watching guys. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com. Thank you.